All right, today we're going to talk about hypothesis testing, especially in context of contingency tables. Um, and this is a good place to start to think about um, how statistics actually work. So let's get start, started testing some hypotheses. The first thing is that you have to think like a statistician. Uh, and statisticians don't test whether or not things are different. They test how likely they are to be the same. And this starts the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that the two groups come from the same underlying population. So in other words, um, the null hypothesis could also be something like, if I draw a sample from this group and I draw a sample from this group, we as we're going to test whether or not they're the same. So the null hypothesis is the starting point. It's the, start where, it's the point where we say, um, how similar are these two things? And, and honestly, in the world, we look around and we start thinking like, well, oh, that person is really different than this person over here. Well, how do you know that? It's because you've figured out what is the same on average so that on average you say, oh, that is really different than my expectation for the average. So honestly, like we talk about differences, but really differences are a, um, an idea that is constructed from what is the same. So we start with the null hypothesis. It's accepted as true without knowing any other information. And this is the benchmark by which we compare the actual outcomes. So. The opposite of the null hypothesis is the research hypothesis. And we tend to think in terms of the research hypothesis, even though statisticians think in terms of the null hypothesis. So the research hypothesis is a statement that there's a relationship between this variable and that variable. So in other words, I think there might be a relationship between caffeine intake and test performance. Or there might be a relationship between uh, this type of policy and this kind of outcome. <clears throat> so. There are two types of hypotheses for research hypotheses. There are non-directional hypotheses, which says, I think that something would be different. I think that this group is going to be different than that group. It doesn't really say in which group is going to be bigger or smaller than the other. And this is sort of, um, this is sort of the basic research hypothesis. And it's the one that we test most often. We anticipate there's a difference. We want to test to see if there's a difference. Um, it's a two-tailed test which, in which we allocate the probability of being wrong to both tails. A directional hypothesis, a directional research hypothesis says, I think that if we do this thing, this will have a positive outcome. Or if this sort of change takes place, this is going to be a negative change in the other dependent variable. It reflects a, a difference. We think that there's an anticipated direction of that relationship. And when we do that, we don't have to allocate our likelihood of being wrong to both sides of the, of the distribution. What we end up doing is we allocate um, all of the error to the other side, one side of the distribution. Okay. Now, there's all sorts of um, ways in which we can construct null and research hypotheses, but here are a couple of them. Um, I'm going to just point down here. There's no relationship between reaction time and problem solving ability. That's a null hypothesis. In other words, we're going to take a sample of people um, <clears throat> and look at their problem, problem solving ability, and we're going to see if reaction time you know, doesn't have an effect on that. In other words, we're going to assume that they're the same and test how the same they are. Well, a, a non-directional research hypothesis would be like, there's a relationship between reaction time and problem-solving ability. Okay, we think there's a relationship there. When we change um, reaction time, or when, you know, when reaction time changes, then problem-solving ability is going to change. But a directional hypothesis would be slightly different. There's a positive relationship between reaction time and problem-solving ability. A positive relationship would be Reaction time goes up, problem solving ability goes up. Reaction time goes down, problem solving ability goes down. So we're specifying the direction of the relationship. And we can test all of those things um, using statistical testing. So <clears throat> just as a basic little review, we always test the null hypothesis. And the you know when we look at a statistical output, what we're seeing is the likelihood that the null hypothesis is true. The null hypothesis is most often there's no difference or there is no relationship. So let's move on to contingency tables and chi-square. Contingency tables and chi-square are non-parametric tests. That means that they aren't based on the mean or a normal distribution. So um, I read this little thing, and there's what we do when we're not normal. Well, the world doesn't always have normal distribution outcomes. And sometimes we need to think about um, different ways to, to think about data. So, Parametric statistics have some certain assumptions. They use means to determine central tendency. Remember, interval ratio data have you can calculate means for. But ordinal data, you cannot calculate means for. And nominal data, you can't calculate means for. So you need other types of statistical tests to do that kind of testing. If you have interval, level, interval ratio level data, and you can generate a mean, then you can use parametric tests. 
So parametric tests have these underlying assumptions that there's no major outliers, there's not a lot of skewness in the data, it's not multimodal, um, and that the variances of both groups are pretty similar. Now we can have some, there are some adjustments to figure out if the variances are different, but really the parametric statistics assume that the, the variances or the dispersion around the mean is more or less the same. The other thing about a parametric statistic is that to use parametric statistics we have to have a large enough sample size that the central limit theorem can kick in. In other words, that over time repeated sampling the distribution of the sample mean is approximately normal. And if that's true, of a big enough sample, then we'll find that the distribution of the sample mean is approximately normal. And if the distribution of the sample mean is approximately normal, then we can use parametric statistics because the distribution of the sample mean is known to us using the t-distribution. Okay, non-parametric statistics don't require the same kind of assumptions. They might use medians. They might use rank order in some other way. They're not affected by outliers. We don't generate means. So they can be used on all sorts of other types of data. They can be used with weird distributions like uniform distributions and multimodal distributions. The other thing that's a benefit for non-parametric samples, uh, non-parametric statistics, is that they're not affected by small sample sizes. You don't need to have the central limit theorem to kick in. You can take a couple, like a handful of samples, and run a non-parametric statistic, and it'll give you some level of confidence how likely that the null hypothesis is correct. So this is pretty rare. We, we very rarely would use a one-sample chi-square test, but a chi-square test allows to determine if what you see, what you observe, is similar, how similar it is to what you would expect by chance. Um, a one-sample chi-square test is a goodness of fit test. It has one dimension. A two-sample chi-square test has two dimensions. We'll talk about that because I'm going to kick through this really fast, quick. When we compute a chi-square, it doesn't matter one sample, two sample. The whole idea here is we're going to add up the differences, difference is the subtraction, between what we observe and what we expect. And we're going to normalize that by, you know, dividing by what we expect. But what does that actually mean? It means that we're trying to just see if, if we add up all of the differences between what we see and what we expect, if those differences are big enough to say that something's different. What do we expect? We expect things would be kind of like normal. We expect that they're going to be the same. That's the null hypothesis. We expect that the two groups are the same. We expect that the three groups are the same. Well, when we go out and calculate a chi-square, we say, well, let's assume if we get 100 samples, or let's say we go 90 samples, that they're going to be 30 in each group if they're all the same. But we find out that there's like 45 in one and 15 in another and 30 in another. Well, that means there's a difference between what we expected in each group and what we saw, what we observed. We add up those differences and see if those differences are big enough to say that those groups are different. So once again, remember the null hypothesis is that all these groups are going to be the same. The research hypothesis is that all these groups are going to be different. When we compute a chi-square, Let's say we're looking at people who are for or maybe or against some certain policy. We get 90 people here. What we observe is that 23 people say they're for, 15, 13 or sorry, 17 or again, um, maybe, and 50 are against. Um, what we would expect is if they're all the same, we would get the same number of people in each group. Then the difference is seven. We would square those differences what we, between what we observe and what we expect. We divide it by what we expect, and we'd end up with a chi-square value. There you go. <clears throat> the chi-square value is a test statistic. That chi-square gives a 20.6. What, um, what we do is we look that up in a table. And in the table, it would say, if with two degrees of freedom, this is the probability that the groups are the same. So you'll see this over and over again. Test statistic equals something. P equals some value. So test statistic will tell you what kind of test you did and what the value of that is. That really isn't super useful for people who are just sort of general statistical consumers. What you really care about is when they say comma p equals or p less than. That p less than is the probability that the null hypothesis is true. So in this instance, 0 0.05, it's, there's a 5% chance, 0.05, that the null hypothesis is true. And the null hypothesis is that there's no difference. There's a 5% chance that there's no difference between the group. What does that mean? Well, that means that there's like a 95% chance that the groups are different. Or in other words, we're 95% confident that the groups are different in this scenario.
Um, so there's a whole bunch of different non-parametric tests. There's all of these. I've used the Man Whitney U. I've used the Wilcoxon Rank test. I've used the Wilcoxon Rank Sum test. I've used the Spearman Rank Crystal Wallace. Essentially, there's a whole bunch of other tests we can look up to see when they might be used and under what conditions. You can just Google that, and it'll tell you. Non-parametric tests um, are pretty powerful with small sample sizes, and there are a whole bunch of them. They're all going to report a test statistic. They're all going to report a comma p equals, and that p equals is what you care about. How likely is it are the groups the same? So when we start analyzing nominal and ordinal data, um, <clears throat> there's some things. We're going to talk today about con contingency tables and chi-square tests. So the descriptive statistics used to sort of summarize nominal and ordinal data are frequencies, percentages. For ordinal data, you can have medians and interquartile ranges, maximums and minimums. The inferential statistics are contingency tables and uh, chi-square tests. For interval ratio data, which we'll cover in another time, we can do means, medium, modes, range, standard deviation, same thing. And we can use t-tests and other non-parametric tests as well. So we don't have to just use parametric tests. We can use non-parametric tests too. So when we, when we talk about building a contingency table, contingency tables are sometimes called cross tabs in Excel. Um, contingency tables are really about displaying data in a table when we're comparing two variables. Um, the thing that you need to know to understand a contingency table is to look for percentages or know how to generate percentages. Um, know when to collapse, use like uh, comparable pieces of data together. We'll talk about that in a second. You might have to know a few more terms, some definitions. Knowing where to put the independent and the dependent variable are really key. And then knowing what observed versus expected means. In other words, when I say, what did we expect? We expect the null hypothesis. What did we observe? That's what our data say. So let me show you with um, how to do, to do contingency tables. When we display uh, frequencies for interval level data, we might buy, like do charts, like a bar chart. We might do a scatter plot. Um, but it doesn't really work for nominal and ordinal data because we can't really scatter the data. They're just like, how many times did something show up? So in other words, what we do is, because we need to display them in a different way, we put them in a table rather than a graph. So a univariate percentage distribution might look like this. To what extent do you agree with the following statement, blah, 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 blah. And you get these certain number of responses over here on the left-hand side. And they have five choices. So out of the 2,500 people, you know, 686 said this. So we take, in order to generate a percentage, 686 out of 2,541 is 27%. And we could do that the whole way down. Um, and what we've done is we've just essentially said what percentage of the group shows up in this different category. Okay, now sometimes we want to collapse those into meaningful, but, uh, meaningful categories that are similar. Uh, so we need to make some decisions about which ones to collapse. Some categories we can't collapse into meaningful things. And we have to retally the frequencies and calculate based on new things. So let's say we don't just care about strongly agree and agree or disagree and strong, strongly disagree. We think they're pretty much the same. We could collapse those and tally them up and put that number here in the middle and then figure out the percentage based on this total number. All right, so a contingency table takes this whole idea about frequency tables, like what we just talked about, and adds them up with a second layer. So in other words, we get to compare not just what one respondent said for one answer, but also maybe for another answer, or one characteristic of an individual with another characteristic of an individual. So we'll talk about some terms. The cells are the pieces of data in the middle that we observe. The marginals are located on the outside. Just like in this last one, these percentage distributions, those are marginals, they're on the end, and the data is right here in these cells in the middle. Uh, we're going to look for the grand total, and then we're going to try and figure out if there's a statistical relationship. So here, this is like where we construct a contingency table. <clears throat> uh, in this one, we're looking at test performance, low and high, and education. And education is the independent variable. We think that education might affect performance. So in education goes across the top. And along the sides, you get the independent, or sorry, the dependent variable, the outcome. So if you were just to look at this, you'd say, well, how do I graph the data? Well, this corner down here is a grand total number of people who um, took the test and we have information about their education. A thousand of those 1,200 people had more than a high school degree and 250 had high school or less. Now, along this side, we get to see these are the marginals. Um, 
around here's the bottom is the marginal frequency and out this side is a marginal frequency. 300 of the 1200 scored low on the test and 950 scored high on the test. So in that univariate distribution like we were talking about just a few minutes ago, when we were just trying to graph the percentages, we would take 300 over 1250 to figure out what percentage of the group scored low. 950 over 1250 to figure out which group scored high or how much scored high. Now the cool thing is that we can go through the data and count how many people who had high school or less education and how they scored. And so we can, these are the cell frequencies, you know, high school or less um, characteristic and what their outcome was more than high school and what their outcome was. And so we've essentially created a frequency distribution in a contingency table that allows us to compare two variables together, a bivariate frequency distribution. Now, if we're trying to figure out what the relationship is, remember which one is independent and which one's dependent. The independent variable here is we think that the education affects performance, so we put those in there. Now, we could write a hypothesis about this, and you'll need to do this. As education increases, does performance on the civil service exam increase? Or in other words, we expect that education is related to performance on the exam. Or we expect a positive relationship between education and performance on the exam. Those are three different ways to do that. The null hypothesis is we don't think that there's a relationship between education and test performance. So think about those sort of relationships. So how do we display this? Independent variable goes across the top. Dependent variable goes across the sides. Uh, we calculate column percentages, not row percentages. Okay, so 200 over 1,000 is 20%, 800 over 1,000 is 80%, same thing over here. So now what we could do is we could compare these percentages. Um, so here, for example, we could say 20% of the people with a more than high school education scored low. And 80% of the people who had more than high school education scored high. 40% with high school or less scored low, 60% scored less uh, and high. So think about this. If I increase my level of education, I increase my performance on the exam, 20% more people scored high if they had more than high school education than if they had less than high school education. In other words, moving from high school education to more than high school education increased test performance by 20%. Or 20% more people scored high if they had more than high school education compared to those who had less than high school education. You can see where I'm working right here. Those are substantive meanings. Those are substantive differences based on the independent variable and what we found. Okay, so we're going to come back to that in just a second. So, how do we display these tables? You'll see this PowerPoint, you can reference it any time. You should display the table in percentage form. All of the cells show up in a percentage. The independent variables placed along the columns, the dependent variables across the rows. The meaning of those categories should have some sort of progression. It shouldn't be random. They should be like from low to high, low to high, or high to low, high to low. Um, <clears throat> We calculate the percentages for the, for the cells, but on the marginals along the bottom, I want you to leave the raw values. The marginals on the, um, the right-hand column, I want you to leave in percentages. The reason is we want to be able to make some comparisons for those percentages. We'll talk about it in just a second. But I also want to know the t raw number of total of people in each of those independent variable categories. Okay, so <clears throat> the easiest way to see if there's a relationship in a contingency table is to look for those percentage differences. And we'll cover this just again, but look for, look for differences between the groups. And you want to compare um, across the rows. Okay, um, this does not note whether or not there's a statistically significant difference. Or in other words, we don't know if that is a real difference. We just know that in our data, we found these, these big differences or small differences in terms of percentages of success or size or whatever that is. A chi-square test is a statistical test to see whether or not this relationship like, exists and whether or not we can be confident that that, re that relationship is different than the null hypothesis. It's, it's a statistical test to determine with, if over time we can be confident in this relationship. Okay. <clears throat> so here's a percentage difference example. Having more than a high school education increases test performance on the exam by 
usually when we, when we do these substantive differences, we say having a insert characteristic has a this sort of relationship as compared to this characteristic. So more than high school education has a 20% difference increase compared to high school or less. So there's a 20% difference here. Okay, so that increases performance on the exam by 20%. Okay, great. <clears throat> now, a chi-square is a measure of statistical significance, which is different. It's not a good measure of strength of association or whether or not, you know, like by what percentage you're going to get bigger or stronger or better or do better. It's a, real, it's a test to see whether or not the laws of probability um, will, will support your statement that this group is really different than that group. Not by how much, but it just is different. Um, there are other tools to look for strength of relationship, like maybe we talked about in correlation, um, an R squared, that's a PRE statistic. We've got gamma, lambda, tau B, tau C, summers D, summers D, YX, Kramer's V. All these programs calculate them for you. Um, you know, SPSS will do that, Stata will do it, SAS will do it, R will do it. They'll calculate those things for you for measures of strength of relationship like R square. That is different than um, whether or not there's a statistical difference. So we're, we're looking for a couple things in these chi-square tests. Look for percentage comparisons, that's a substantive difference. A statistical significance, how likely is it that the groups are the same or different. And then we can look to see if there's a strong pattern of association. That's a whole different set of tests. So here's the chi-square statistic. Remember, this is the same thing that we saw before. I just inserted these Fs here. This is the frequency observed minus the frequency expected squared over the frequency expected. And we add up. What are we doing? We are comparing the difference between what we saw, what we observed, and what we expect. We're going to add up those differences. So <clears throat> here's the example drawn from that same one. Chi-square tests compare the frequencies and not percentages. So we don't want to ever collect data in terms of percentages. We want to use the raw numbers. So if we look over here in this right marginal, um, there are 300 people who scored low and 950 who scored high on the exam. If the null hypothesis is true, 24% of all of the people scored low on the exam and 36% of the people, sorry, 76% of the people scored high. That would mean that regardless of education, so if education didn't matter, null hypothesis, there's no difference, then 24% of the people in the more than high school group would score low and 24% of the less than high school group would score low because they would be all the same. And 76% would score high, 76% of 1,000 would score high, and 76% of 250 would score high. If you need to re-watch this portion of the video to figure out what we're talking about, feel free to do so. So what we do is we generate the expected percentages. So looking over here, if these two groups do not matter, the independent variable has no effect on the dependent variable, then we're going to see 24% of each of these groups score low and 76% of each of these groups score high. So we take 24% and we multiply it by 1,000 and we get a number here. 76% multiply that by 1,000 and we put that here. Same thing here, 250 by 76, we put that here. 24% by, by 250, put that here. So that's what we get. So <clears throat> if we, what we're doing is we're trying to figure out what we expect if the null hypothesis is true. If the null hypothesis is true, then the groups are the same. But the problem is that the groups have different number of people in each of those groups. So we have to standardize that by multiplying the size of the group times the percentage to figure out how many people would be there. Okay, so that would mean that out of the 300 people, 250 people would be here and 600 would be here because 250 people were here and 1,000 people were here. So 1,000 times 24, this percent, gives 250. And um, 250 times 24 gives us 60 here. We do the same for this other column. Now, what we actually observed were, were not those numbers. This is what we expect you know, in each of these columns. But what we observed is this. In, I put these little uh, cell notations here so you can see. In cell A, we saw 100, but we expected 60. We could go back to figure out where we expected 60 from the, from the few before. This is what we, we saw from these, these in the initial slides. So these are what we initially ob observed. We generated an expected number. 
Now we're at a spot where we compare what we observed minus what we expected. So we take 100 and you minus 60. You take 200 and you minus 40. And so what I've done is in each of these different cells, I've written the difference between the cells between what we've observed and what we expected. Now, <coughs> cell A, we observed 100, we expected 60, and that's a difference of 40. In order to calculate the chi-square, we square that number. We do that for all of these cells. And then we divide by the frequency expected. So we divide that by 60. We get this number. All those numbers are, they're a measure of the difference between what we observed and what we expected. That's all it is. The chi-square statistic is just a measure of the difference between what we observed and what we expected. We tally that all up, and then we go, okay, my chi-square is 43.87. What do I do with that? Um, you look it up in a table. So look, we just did this, observed, calculated and expected, subtracted it, squared, divided it by what we expected, add up all those cells, that gives us this chi-square number. So we go look it up in a, in a, in a chi-square table, and you'll need to know the degrees of freedom. And that's pretty easy. The degrees of freedom is the number of columns minus one times the number of rows minus one. In this instance, <coughs> um, you know, we can look that up. But anyway, the decision rule is, in other words, is to say that in, under normal circumstances, there's going to be differences between what we observe and what we expect. But at some point, the difference between what we observe and we expect is really, really, really different. So um, down here, the chi-square distribution looks like this. Down here on the bottom left of the chart, we're going to have some times that there's like a little bit of difference, but the groups really aren't different. And as that difference grows, the chi-square grows, it becomes less and less likely that the groups are the same because the differences are so big that statistically the groups can't really be the same. So we look it up, two degrees, two degrees of, or sorry, one degree of freedom. We look for these decision values. It's the probability less than 0.1. So you actually don't even need to look up on the table because Excel does this for you, SPSS does this for you. They'll generate a p-value. So <clears throat> what we found is that there is a, group, a difference. Why do we know that? Well, because the probability of no relationship is very small. The probability that the null hypothesis is true is less than 0.1%. So we can be like 99.9% .9 confident that there's a difference between uh, less than high school and high school graduates when it comes to um, their performance on that exam. Okay, <clears throat> we talked about measure of association. The significance of relationship is a chi-square. The even back up a little bit before it, a substantive difference, like a percent comparison between those columns, that's the first way to see if there's a difference. Then we test for statistical significance, so you took a chi-square test. And then we want to see, maybe if you want to, do magnitude of relationship, these other ones, for ordinal measures those, nominal measures these other ones. Um, they're based on this idea, like on a scatter plot, if the data are scattered in a certain way, you can kind of see a line. Well. Relationships and contingency tables will look the same way if you set them up right. So let's imagine you have a scenario where you have those same columns A, B, C, D, control and treatment. If uh, low is bad and high is good and control is nothing and treatment is you know, some drug that you're giving somebody to help them get better, um, what you would hope, a perfectly correlated positive relationship would say, look, if we gave them nothing, they scored low. But if we gave them some treatment, they scored high. And in a perfect linear relationship, every one of those data points would be in A and in D. And there would be no data points in C or B. Like you gave them some treatment and they still got a low score. Or you gave them a control, like you gave them a placebo, and they scored high. So the idea in contingency tables, just like if we're drawing a scatter plot and a, a regression line, you know, fitting on that, you know, Pearson's R, we can't really do that in a contingency table. So what we do is we look for these concordant and discordant pairs. And on, our, on, a, on this slide, concordant pairs would be um, A and D, that would be positive, um, or C and B if you're looking for a perfectly negative relationship. But the unhighlighted squares, like B and C in the top right, those are discordant. Those are the ones that we don't really, they don't confirm our hypothesis, our, our hypothesis. They're the ones that are error. If the line looks like this from A to D, in other words, 
all of the data points are in A and D because the treatment was 100% effective and the control group was absolutely not effective at all, we wouldn't have anything in B or C. And that would be a perfectly um, uh, concordant pair, super strong relationship. But we're going to have some in B and we're going to have some in C, and those are discordant pairs. Now down here it's the exact opposite, um, where all the concordant pairs would be in this brown highlight and none of the discordant pairs would be in A and D. It's based on how you build your table and what your hypothesis is. So all of the measures of association for contingency tables are comparisons of concordant and discordant pairs in the cells. And they're cumbersome to calculate by hand. Some of them are better than others. For example, lambda, gamma, tau, b, c, and summer z are all PRE statistics and can be interpreted as percentages. So if you're going to do those, those are just like R squared, and we can um, report those in a, in, a, you know, in a report and say, well, knowing the relationship between these two variables gives us 90, you know, uh, reduces our error in our estimate by 90%, or knowing the value of the independent variable gives us 90% confidence in understanding the outcome. So uh, those are pretty important if we want to do those for contingency tables. So I want you to stop for a second, stop the video, take a breath, review what you need to, because in just a second we're going to go on. Okay, so another thing that looks a lot like a contingency table is analysis of a variance, which is also called ANOVA. ANOVA is like a, um, a contingency table, except it also uses means. So now we have to go back um, to different kinds of variables. And there's all sorts of variations of ANOVA, but essentially you're doing the same thing as like a t-test comparing means, but you're doing it in a way that it's like a contingency table and breaks it down. So what, what, what analysis of variance does is it compares the difference between the means, but also compares the variance between groups and within groups. So the guy who created it is R.A. Fisher, and we get an F statistic. So if you're doing a t-test, you get a t-statistic. If you're doing a chi-square test, you get a chi-statistic. Um, and if you're doing an analysis of variance, you get an F statistic. So I'm going to give you some, some examples of what ANOVA looks like. But you should think about it first. ANOVA is not the right test for everyone. So take a pause, look at this, look at the PowerPoint. If you're testing between different kinds of groups, ANOVA might be the right test, it might not be the right test. If you're just comparing two groups, t-tests are always better. If you're comparing three groups, ANOVA is better. Um, now, you know, we can talk more about that in just a second. There's all sorts of different flavors of ANOVA. It's going to compare the variance in the groups and between the groups. Um, it's like doing a t-test, but doing multiple t-tests all at the exact same time. A one-way ANOVA is like a simple one. It's a single grouping variable. Like you want to compare um, political affiliation between, um, you know, uh, individuals based on race or something like that. Um, a multi or a two-way ANOVA compares like some outcome using two different factors, and we'll talk more about that in just a second. Here's an example of like a more complicated ANOVA. It's called a factorial design, and this would be, um, let's say, we want to look at student achievement based on gender and number of hours in preschool per week. This is what's called a three by two factorial design, two in terms of gender and three different treatments for number of hours in preschool. So in a sense, because we have a three by two factorial design, we are comparing the, we, we would, the means or the average achievement for these individuals, average student achievement, but that's six different groups. So that's multiple independent variables. So that's number of hours in preschool. That's three different treatments and two different um, categories for gender. You've got six different groups that you're measuring and you're going to compare them like a t-test, except you might have a relationship between males and females. Like there might be just gender differences and there that, you know, females perform better overall and males perform better overall. So that's within a group between males and females, but also between groups. That's to say um, comparison. So uh, sorry, but between groups would be, sorry, 
Between groups would be the difference between males and females, right? And within groups is like, there might be differences between uh, males based on how many hours of preschool they get per week. That's a within group treatment, the male being the grouping variable, and number of hours given to uh, female students, that's within the group. Within the male group, you get three different treatments. But also, you get between group uh, comparisons between males and females. So you're comparing not only within the group, but between the group. So that's more or less how ANOVA works. What it does is it calculates a sum of squared errors. Now you don't really need to know what that means, but it's essentially the same thing as a contingency table in a chi-square test. What do we observe? What do we expect? How much difference is there between the groups and within the groups? And it calculates these, and you get this mean squared error, and it generates this F. The F is what you care about. In a source table, that's what matters. And then you have to figure out the degrees of freedom. Don't worry, SPSS will do this for you. It's like the numerator is a certain number of groups, minus something or other, K through N, K minus N, K minus 1. In the denominator, it's the number of participants, minus 1. So you get this represented like this, F2, comma 27. So ultimately, in the end, your SPS output or your statistical output will say this. And this is what you need to learn to figure out. In the same way we did chi-square equals 48 point something something, comma p equals less than 0.01, this is standard notation. I did an F test, some variant of ANOVA. These were the degrees of freedom. This tells us more or less how many categories and how many individuals. And the F test gave us a result of 8. That out of context means nothing. But what you care about is, hey, p, the probability that there's no relationship either between the group or within the group is less than 0.05. Cool, what does that mean? Well, somewhere either between the groups or within the groups, there we have a 90% chance that there's a difference. At least one of those, uh, at least one of those different uh, groups is significantly different than the other groups. It could be that they're all different from each other, or it could be that one group is really different than each other. That's the biggest problem with ANOVA is it's an omnibus test, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. So, when you look at these, you can say, hey look, this person did an F, some variant of ANOVA, they got some value. The probability that there's no relationship is this, which means the inverse is true. The probability of a relationship is 95%. Okay. An omnibus test is just testing that there is a difference. It's not testing where that difference is, just that in that three by two factorial design, for example, there was a difference in one of those six cells. At least one of those six cells is different than at least one of those other six cells. That actually is not super useful because it doesn't tell you where those differences are, just that they exist. So what we do is we do follow-up tests, follow-up t-tests to find out where the differences are. And actually there's some settings in SPSS that will allow you to do follow-up tests to find the exact ones which are different than each other. But every time you do a follow-up test, you are increasing the likelihood of a, one, a type one error. In other words, that you might, um, you might find that there is a difference when there isn't or you might find that there isn't a difference when there is. That's a type two error. So you have to be careful in these follow-up tests. Now, if it were me, um, I would look at a different set of things. So in SPSS output, you'd go down here, the ANOVA table says, look, here's the F value, here's my statistical significance, sig is equal to P. So if I were writing this up, I would say, look, I did this one-way ANOVA looking at treatment of different types of hours. I conducted a statistical test, F equals 8.799, comma, P less than 0.01. In other words, we found that there was a statistically significant difference between these groups. Cool. What does that look like? Well, if you look here at the mean, the mean is 76 for the five hours. For 10 hours, it's 85, and for 20 hours, it's 91. So it looks like the more hours you have, that performance measure goes up. Now, go back in here into these lower and upper bounds. What these are is they're saying we are 90% confident that the group, five-hour group, the average is 76, but 
we're 95% that the, that the real estimate of their performance is between 68 on the low end and 85 on the upper end. And we could do this for all these different groups. And then I would look in this table and say, are there any of these groups that overlap in values? So look, this 10 hour group and the 20 hour group between 80 and 77, and, sorry, 80, 80, 77 and 89, 63, that actually overlaps with this group here, 89.16 and 94.06. So in other words, what I'm saying is, if you got 20 hours, you got your range, 95% confidence range is here to here. And if you got 10 hours, your 95% confidence level is here. And you have this little area between point, um, 89.16 and 89.63 that overlaps. In other words, you actually, there's no, you can't be confident that those two groups are different. But if you go at the five hour group, they're way, way, way over here. You can't even see me off of my screen. Their lowest score could be as low as 68 and their highest score could, could be as high as 85. And the next closest group, 80 to 90, they overlap there. So we can't really tell the difference between five and 10 hours because they overlap. But between 68 and 85, and then 89 and 94, they never overlap, which means that those two groups are 95% confident that those groups are different. They never overlap, they're never the same. So instead of going back and doing these follow-up t-tests, if you look at the descriptive statistics and you look at your 95% confidence intervals, you can more or less figure out which groups are different than each other.